Hello everyone, thank you for your response to my previous video and in this video we will be discussing about the female reproductive system. And you should know that the female reproductive system is quite complex if we compare this with the male reproductive system. In fact, the female reproductive system is divided into four parts, one being the menstrual cycle, then we have the pregnancy, then the parturition and finally we will discuss about the lactation. Now we are beginning with the menstrual cycle and in the further lectures we will also discuss about the other phases as well. So, as we discussed in males, in females also, we have a hypothalamus secreting gonadotropin releasing hormone. This gonadotropin releasing hormone, after it acts on the anterior pituitary, it will cause the release of follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. Now, this follicle stimulating hormone, as the name suggests, follicle stimulating, therefore, it must be causing the stimulation of follicles. So, it converts the primordial follicle into the graphene follicle. So the main function of follicle stimulating hormone is stimulating the development of primordial follicle into mature graphene follicle. So its function is follicular development. Now, somewhere between the fo primordial follicle and graphene follicle, we'll also get one follicular stage known as secondary follicle. Actually, primordial follicle is converted into primary follicle and the primary follicle is converted into secondary follicle then the secondary follicle will be converted to graphene follicle now the secondary follicular stage or in fact the graphene follicle stage also will have two types of cells one known as granulosa cells and the one known as theca cells these are two covering cells and these have two surface receptors for uh, two different hormones one for the luteinizing hormone and the one for the follicle stimulating hormone if we discuss about the granulosa cells they are the surface receptor for the follicle stimulating hormone. And if we discuss about the theca cell, their surface receptor is for the luteinizing hormone. So in males, we have studied that the follicle stimulating hormone acts on the surface receptor of the sertoli cells, while the luteinizing hormone acts on the surface receptor of the leading cells. But in females, the follicle stimulating hormone will act on the granulosa cells, while the luteinizing hormone will act on the theca cells. Now, after stimulation of luteinizing hormone with theca cells, theca cells will form androgens. And these androgens will travel into the granulosa cells where there is an important enzyme known as aromatase. Okay. You should know that this aromatase is activated by follicle stimulating hormone. Because we have discussed this in the male reproductive system also that the follicle stimulating hormone activates aromatase. And this aromatase converts androgens into estrogen. Like in males, we studied that this aromatase converted male androgen, testosterone, into the estradiol, which is in fact a form of estrogen. And likewise, in female reproductive system also, the androgens are converted into estrogen in the presence of aromatase. That's the first thing. And after this estrogen is formed, it will cause the growth or proliferation of endometrium. You should know that this uh, estrogen has its major function that it causes growth. Now if we discuss about its function in breast, it will cause the development of breast. If we discuss its function in uterus, it will cause the proliferation of uterus. So it will cause the growth of proliferation in endometrium of the uterus. Now, <coughs> there is an important thing regarding estrogen. That is, that the increase in levels or high levels of estrogen will cause the decrease in the level of follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. I discussed about the increasing levels. So when the estrogen starts to increase, it will inhibit the uh, formation of follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. This is the normal negative feedback. So I'll explain this with this graph. See, first we have the increased levels of follicle stimulating hormone that I have marked in blue and also the luteinizing hormone that I have marked in black. So at first we have the increased levels of both follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. But then the estrogen starts to be formed by the graphene follicle or the secondary oocyte and when it starts to be formed it will inhibit the levels of both follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone but there is an important thing that this estrogen will inhibit follicle stimulating hormone more than the luteinizing hormone but there is a big question that why it inhibits follicle stimulating hormone more than the luteinizing hormone the reason is that this follicle stimulating hormone as we know it helps in the development of follicle and we only want one follicle to develop during one menstrual cycle or the ovarian cycle <coughs> therefore in order to ensure that there is only one follicle development therefore there we inhibit the amount of follicle stimulating hormone by the estrogen 
in the later phase of the follicular stage. So, high levels of estrogen will inhibit follicular stimulating hormone as well as luteinizing hormone, but it will inhibit follicular stimulating hormone more than the luteinizing hormone. But then comes the most important and unusual phenomena within the female reproductive system, and it's very rare in our body. What happens that this estrogen, when it becomes at when it becomes very high, in fact, when it passes a certain threshold, it changes its negative feedback to positive feedback. Now, what do I mean by this? See, first I told you that the high levels of estrogen will inhibit both follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. But then, when the levels of estrogen become very high, they will cause the increase in the amount of synthesis of follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So very high synthesis of estrogen will cause the very high synthesis of both the luteinizing hormone and the follicular stimulating hormone. So as we discussed first, follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone will be synthesized, but then estrogen will be formed and these two will start to decrease. But then there are very high when it reaches to a very high level, it will turn from the negative feedback to the positive feedback. Therefore, now we, what we will have is the high levels of LH and the follicular stimulating hormone. And this LH, this sudden increase in the LH level is known as LH surge. Now, what do I mean by surge? Surge means a hormone concentration that leads to its peak and the lowest concentration within 24 hours. So, the luteinizing uh, hormone will reach to its highest amount and its lowest amount within 24 hours. And this is caused by the very high levels of estrogen. In fact, estrogen increases, very high levels of estrogen will increase the luteinizing hormone 6 to 10 folds and will increase the follicle stimulating hormone. 2 to 10 folds because it will <coughs> when uh, there are very high levels of estrogen it will stimulate the synthesis of luteinizing hormone more than the follicle stimulating hormone so this was a very important thing that the high levels of estrogen will inhibit the synthesis of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone but the very high levels of estrogen will stimulate the synthesis of both follicle stimulating hormone as well as the luteinizing hormone and due to these two effects that is the both high levels of follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone will cause the ovulation. In fact, they will stimulate some proteases which will erode the wall of the ovary and the ovulation will take place. Now, after ovulation, there is an important thing that you should know that LH surge develops the LH receptors in the granulosa cells. What do I mean by this? See, till now you have studied that the receptors, surface receptors on the granulosa cells are for the follicle stimulating hormone. But after this LH surge, this LH surge will develop LH receptors also on the granulosa cells. So now there will be LH receptors on both theca cells as well as granulosa cells. And what it will do, it will help in the synthesis of progesterone from the granulosa cells. So it, now this uh, LH will also act on the granulosa cells and what it will do, it will convert these androgens into progesterone also. So what we will have is the progesterone as well as estrogen. So now, after LH surge, what happens that LH receptors develop on the granulosa cell and there will be synthesis of estrogen as well as progesterone. And also there happens an important another thing that is, for example, this is a graphene follicle and within this, there is the secondary oocyte. This secondary oocyte is ovulated and the remaining cells will deposit a protein in presence of LH that is known as lutein protein. And this lutein protein will convert this graphene follicle or the remaining cells of the graphene follicle into corpus luteum. So what I mean to say is that this oocyte, after the secondary oocyte is released, the remaining cells of the graphene follicle will de uh, deposit lutein protein and that lutein protein will convert the graphene follicle into the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum will obviously synthesize both estrogen as well as progesterone because LH receptors are developed on granulosa cells. So that's an important thing that you should remember. Now, the function of progesterone. The function of progesterone is it increases the secretory activities. If we discuss about its functions in breast, it will happen the synthesis of milk. Uh, synthesis of milk, if we discuss its functions within the uterus, it will help in the formation or the development of the uterine glands or what we call as the uh, uterine secretion, it will increase the uterine secretions. So that is the function of progesterone. But there is an important link of this uh, to the pharma that is in the patients of uh, wasting, having the wasting syndrome due to cancer, we give them a synthetic form of uh, 
progesterone known as medroxyprogesterone. Now why we give this medroxyprogesterone to the patients who are having wasting syndrome due to cancer? Because an important function of progesterone is that it increases the appetite. So the patients having wasting syndrome due to cancer can be treated by giving the medroxyprogesterone and also it increases the body temperature. So the progesterone also increases the body temperature, therefore the post ovulatory females are hot. Okay. Now, after the formation of corpus luteum, you should know that the life of corpus luteum is only for 14 days and it will start to involute uh, in the mid of uh, these 14 days, like approximately in the 7th day, it will start to involute. In, uh, I mean the 7th day of the luteal phase, okay, not the 7th day of the whole menstrual cycle. So, it will start to involute. Therefore, when it involutes, it will convert into corpus albicans. And this corpus albicans do not form any hormone, neither estrogen nor progesterone. Therefore, due to the withdrawal of hormones, because these two hormones are important for the development as well as the maintenance of the uh, uh, ovarian, sorry, uterine lining. Therefore, when there is withdrawal of these two hormones, we will see menses or the pre-vaginal discharge of blood. Now, if I explain this with the help of a graph, see, first we have increased levels of follicle stimulating hormone as well as utilizing hormone. Then the estrogen starts to increase. We have decreasing levels of both follicle stimulating hormone as well as the luteinizing hormone. When the estrogen levels become very really high, they will stimulate the synthesis of both luteinizing hormone as well as the follicle stimulating hormone, causing the ovulation. And after that, this estrogen will start to decrease. Why? Because of the down regulation by the luteinizing hormone. But then again, it will start to be formed. In fact, both progesterone and as well as the estrogen starts to be synthesized by the corpus luteum and because now what we see is the development of the uh, LH receptors on the granular cells. Therefore, there will be progesterone as well as the estrogen. But then it speaks in the middle of the cycle as on the 23rd uh, day. But then what we see, we see the decrease in both the progesterone as well as the estrogen levels. Why? Because now the corpus luteum will start to involute, therefore the hormone levels will decrease. And as the hormone levels will decrease, what we will see in the initial part, we will see menses or the pre-vaginal discharge of blood. That's everything about the hormonal change within the menstrual cycle. Now I will wrap it up in a simple diagram and I will complete this topic. Now, what we discuss in menstrual cycle is that there are rhythmic changes within hormones. For example, First, we have the increased amount of follicle stimulating hormone and reutilizing hormone. Then we have the increased amount of estrogen. Then we have increased amount of both LH and FSH. Then we have the increase of the progesterone and the estrogen. So there are rhythmic changes within the hormones. And those rhythmic changes within the hormones will cause a change within the ovaries. So first, we have rhythmic changes within the uh, hormones causing the change within the ovaries. And these ovarian changes. What, for example, development of follicle cause the formation of estrogen. This estrogen, this change within the ovary will cause the change within the uterus. For example, this estrogen will cause the growth within the uterus. Okay, so the change within the hormone will cause the change within the ovary, and the change within the ovary will cause the change within the uterus. So that is the cycle. That is the menstrual cycle. In fact, the menstrual cycle is formed of the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. Now I mark the ovarian cycle in black and I have marked the uterine cycle in the green. First we will discuss about the ovarian cycle. See, in the ovarian cycle, we first have the follicular phase and that is the phase during which there are high levels of follicle stimulating hormone causing the development of follicle and when the follicle is developed, it will cause the formation of estrogen. Therefore, this phase is also the estrogenic phase and that estrogen will cause the growth or the reactivation, which we can also call as proliferation of the endometrial lining. Therefore, this phase is also known as proliferative phase. This phase in uterus is known as proliferative phase. Then, when the follicle is developed, it will ovulate. The secondary oocyte will ovulate. And ovulation, after ovulation, after the ovula, secondary oocyte is ovulated, the remaining cells of the graphene follicle will be converted into corpus luteum. Therefore, this phase will now be called as luteal phase. And during the corpus luteum development or during the luteal phase, we have this the progesterone. Therefore, this phase is also known as progesteronic phase. And within the progesterone, there are secretions, uh, there are increased secretions from the uterus. Therefore, this phase within the uterus is known as secretory phase. And then, when the 
corpus luteum will involute or be converted into corpus albicans. There will not be any hormone. Therefore, through the withdrawal of hormones, we will see or will observe the menstrual phase or the pre vaginal discharge of blood. So, that is the overall discussion of the menstrual cycle. Now, if we discuss about the days, that is very important. Luteal phase is fixed for 14 days. Because the involution of corpus luteum is fixed for 14 days. So the corpus luteum, the life of the corpus luteum is fixed for 14 days. If the pregnancy does not occur. So if we have to discuss about the ovulation, uh, the date of ovulation, what we do is we subtract 14 from the cycle length. For example, if I have a cycle length of 1014, for example, and if we have to calculate the date of ovulation, what we will do, we will subtract 14 from this. And what I will get 1000. So that will be the date of ovulation. So the date of ovulation is calculated by this formula that is the cycle length minus 14. This is the ovulation date. Because the luteal phase is fixed. The post ovulated phase, that the phase after ovulation is fixed, therefore we uh, fix for 14 days, therefore we subtract 14 in order to get the ovulation date. However, the follicular phase is variable. So why this variable? I'll explain this with an example. For example, a chef takes 30 minutes to roast a chicken. However, he only takes 10 minutes to fry it. But we take equal amount of time to eat the chicken. For example, if it is roasted, we'll take 10 minutes. And if it is fried, we'll take 10 minutes. A chef takes different types to cook different types of food. Likewise, we take different time to develop a follicle. One follicle takes some more amount, one follicle, another follicle takes less amount. But the death of the corpus luteum or the involution of the corpus luteum is fixed of 14 days. Therefore, the follicle phase is, follicular phase is variable. However, the luteal phase is fixed. And after this luteal phase, we will see the menstruation because of the withdrawal of uh, both the hormones. And this we can observe as the pre-vaginal discharge of blood. And that's everything about the menstrual cycle. And if you have any doubt regarding this chapter, you can ask me in the comment section. Thank you everyone and have a nice day.